Hi, it's me, Franklin. Here I am, you're an airplane. In the last couple of weeks, we've been spending time thinking about file systems. And we've been looking both at the physical structure of a disc, so a rotational disc, and we've been looking at the more abstract, how do we represent files on this disc? And how do we take data structures and put information into those data structures and then put those data structures on disk and how do we get information off of a disk that has these data structures using an API. This was relatively close to thinking about hardware. We definitely thought about hardware. In the rest of the course we're going to be moving on to thinking about memory and really specifically we're going to be trying to think about how to implement a system of virtual memory. So from the perspective of the operating system, our goal is to try and make it seem to processes that are running on the system as though they are all running independently of one another and they have all of memory entirely to themselves. When was the last time that you wrote a program where you really had to think about what about other processes in memory? I have to worry about them. Do I have to worry about them? The main goals of an operating system are to make it seem as though user processes are entirely by themselves in memory, so they don't have to worry about stuff like that. It's also to help make sure that user processes cannot interfere with each other. So you can't have one user process begin to interfere with the memory of one, another process. A lot of this is historically motivated. The earliest, earliest systems that we can think about and that we know about have this design where user processes, they just use the entire machine all by themselves. Modern operating systems continue this, this idea. They continue this perception for user processes. In chapter 13, we looked at this idea of address spaces. What does it mean for something to have an address space and how is that different from physical memory? There's a chapter that we skipped, chapter 14, and chapter 14 kind of takes you through the memory management API. So functions like malloc and free. In that, I, I'm fairly certain that most of us have seen these APIs before. I, I kind of just left that off, but if you feel like you need a refresher on how to use malloc and free, uh, please go ahead and take a look at chapter 14. Chapter 15 now is going to introduce us to this idea of how do we actually implement virtual memory as an operating system. And so surprise, we need some help from hardware to do this. As with a lot of the problems that we have looking at things from the perspective of an operating system, we really need to have some hardware support. Sometimes it's fairly minimal and sometimes it's we, we just couldn't possibly do this without the hardware. Our first approach to looking at this is we, we actually can do this without the hardware, but it's going to be a lot better if we were to do this with hardware. So let's start taking a look at this. So in chapter 15, we're going to be taking a look at how to implement virtual memory as a concept. The main goal of this is to give user processes this perception that they are alone in memory and that they have access to their entire address space without having to worry about other processes either interfering with their memory or themselves interfering with the, the memory of other processes. The other thing that we want to do is have more than one process actually running at the same time. We want to have this ability to run multiple processes at the same time. And so these two things combined are basically going to mean that we want to have these processes that have virtual address spaces. They have complete access to all address space that they are provided. We want to have multiple of these processes running at the same time. What this kind of ultimately means is that processes are going to have this idea that all of their addresses start at address zero. Their virtual perception of addresses start at zero, where in reality, a user process might actually be placed in some other physical place in memory. The perception of address zero for a process may actually physically be at some other part of physical memory. We actually are going to use hardware for a couple of things here. One of them is to help us make these translations between what a process perceives as address zero 
and the physical location and memory where the address space for this process starts. We're going to get hardware to help us do these translations and we're going to get hardware to help us enforce these translations and enforce limits. So we want it to be fast, we want it to be transparent, and we want it to be secure. We're going to start with a couple of unrealistic assumptions here. So kind of similar to almost all of the different situations that we've been looking at and all the different parts of operating systems that we've been looking at, we have to start with some unrealistic assumptions so that we can start making some basic progress on this. The first unrealistic assumption that we have that we're going to change very quickly is that the address space for a process when it's in physical memory is contiguous. So what I mean by that is that byte zero, address zero for this process is physically next to address one for this process, is physically next to address two for this process, is physically next to address three for this process. The other unrealistic assumption that we're going to make is that the virtual address space for a process is smaller than physical memory. Now this is a, this is a really, really unrealistic assumption. When we think about writing processes, when we think about writing programs, we think about, for example, a 64-bit process having access to 64 bits of address space. The assumption that we're going to start with here is that these processes are going to have some small amount of address space and it's going to be smaller than physical memory. So if we have one gigabyte of RAM, we're going to make this assumption that our user processes have less than one gigabyte of addresses. To give you an idea of what I mean by this, I'm going to show you a figure that comes a little bit further in the chapter, but I think it provides a good il illustration of what I mean. So this is figure 15.2. In figure 15.2, we have one single user process that's in physical memory, and that one single user process has a 16 kilobyte address space. So right kind of in the middle of this diagram here, this user process has 16 kilobytes of address space, and the physical size of memory here is 64 kilobytes. Address 0 for this process starts at 32 kilobytes, and address 1 is physically next to it. So all of the, the addresses and all the bytes for this process are physically next to each other. They're all stacked up on top of each other. So these are the unrealistic assumptions that we have when we're starting to think about and starting to build this virtualization of memory. Let's take a look at an example. The example that we're going to take a look at here is, is really about the kinds of translations that can happen for a user process. And the example that we're going to look at here is taking a look at some code combined with a virtual address space and a physical address space to give us an idea of the kinds of translations that need to take place while a program or a process is actually executing on the CPU. So things like fetching instructions and things like getting data from memory, what happens and what, what translations need to take place when that's going on. Let's take a look at figure 15.1 first. Figure 15.1 is a process and its address space. So this is kind of a zoom in on the figure 15.2 that we have where it's showing just the address space for a single process. You'll see here that this is a 16 kilobyte address space and the layout of this is consistent with our perception of the different parts of memory that we have. So at zero kilobytes for this process, we have the program code. So this is where all the compiled instructions are going to be for this process within the address space of the process. Below that is the heap, and this is where dynamic allocations are going, and that grows downwards. And then way down at the bottom, we've got the stack. And the stack is where we are putting our stack frames. So as we call functions, local variables are going to go into the stack. So all of this is contained within this 16 kilobyte address space. Here is a little bit of code that we might want to execute on this process. So there's a function, it's got a single stack variable called x that's assigned a value of 3000 to begin with. And you can see that this corresponds to this 3000 at around 15 kilobytes in the address space of the process. And then we increment that. So we add three to, to the value at X. I've got no idea what thanks Perry means. It's not really explained in the textbook. So I don't know. Maybe you should just pretend that the author's got an imaginary friend named Perry. 
We're gonna take a look specifically at the line of code that's incrementing x, so adding x to three. And remember that when we add to a value in a single statement, that single statement is not atomic. It, it kind of breaks down into multiple instructions here. So here's the assembly language that that single statement would be compiled down into. And it's, it's fairly consistent with the x plus plus that we've seen before. Assuming that our program counter now, the program counter register is at 128, so we're starting to execute this line of code, and we can see these lines of code in the stack, or in the address space diagram itself, figure 15.1. So 128, 132, 135. Assuming that the program counter is at 128, the actions that we're going to have to take to execute this code are that we first have to fetch the code at address 128. We fetch the code from address 128, we execute the instruction, which then is to load from address at 15k. So we're going to say that ebx is 15k. We're going to execute this instruction, and the instruction is to load, load something from memory, so move something from memory into a register. And we're going to say that ebx here is to, some, to pointing at something like 15 kilobytes. We're going to fetch the next instruction, so the program counter has incremented. We're going to fetch the next instruction from address 132, and there's no memory references in this instruction. So this is just that add. So we're going to change the value of the uh, value that we just fetched from the, from the memory into the register. We're going to change that, and we're going to add 3 to it. And then the last one is fetch the instruction at 135. We change the program counter again. We fetch the instruction, we execute the instruction, and this time we're going to write back into memory. So we're going to write back into that same location. We're going to say that EBX still has this value of 15 kilobytes. All of this is, is happening from the perspective of the user process. The hardware is responsible for executing these instructions for us. The hardware is responsible for doing things like updating the program counter and so on. But all of this is happening from the perspective of the user process. Figure 15.2 is what we would actually want to happen. What we've just looked at is what happens from our perspective as a user process. So our address space starts at zero kilobytes and goes up to 16 kilobytes. From an operating system building a virtual memory system, we want to be able to put this process in any location in memory. Figure 15.2, let's take a look at this again. This is the reality. This is the physical layout of memory that we would like to have. This is what we desire to have as an operating system so that we can have multiple processes running at the same time. One of the things that you might notice about this is that physically address zero, between address zero and 16 kilobytes, that first block, that first chunk there, that itself is allocated to the operating system. The operating system, is code, right? The operating system is code and it needs to go somewhere in memory and a logical place to put it is at the beginning of memory. That kind of means that with figure 15.1 where this process believes that it starts at zero kilobytes, it's not really going to work because that's where the operating system lives. We need to put it somewhere else in memory. In this case, we've put it into addresses starting at 32 kilobytes and moving upwards. So this is still a 16 kilobyte process a 16 kilobyte address space. And the goal here is ultimately that we would want to be able to put other processes, address spaces, in these other two regions that are marked currently as not in use. What we have to do to be able to accomplish this is to make translations between the virtual address, so process that's running with this address space believes that address 132 is where that instruction is, we need to make a translation so that when the, when the CPU is actually fetching an instruction from physical memory, it fetches it from the right location, from the actual physical location in memory where that address actually translates to. We want this all to be transparent. We want this to be efficient and we want this to be secure. We really do not want the user process to have to care about the translations. We don't want it to have to be responsible for doing those translations and we don't want it to have the ability to do those translations. Our approach then is to use something called dynamic and then hardware-based relocation. We want this to be really fast, we want this to be safe, and we want this to be transparent to user processes. For what it's worth, we can actually do this in software. 
There's nothing stopping us from doing this in software and it has been done in the past. Software-based relocation is, is basically a compile time step or a link time step. As you're setting up the, as you're taking the source code and compiling it down into instructions, you'll use uh, some knowledge about how you're going to run this program and where it's going to reside in memory to help uh, set the addresses that you're actually using in that, uh, in that process. And there's an aside here that kind of describes this. But the problem with this is that it's not very safe. Doing software-based relocation effectively means that a user process can still actually go beyond where it's supposed to go, and it can go before where it's supposed to go. If it has some knowledge about it, it's going to be compiled this way. So we need some hardware support to help us do this quickly, to help us do it safely, and to help us do it transparently, so that user processes and programs don't need to be recompiled or to have some kind of software run on them before they start up to, to, uh, to help accomplish this. The most primitive kind of approach that we're going to use in hardware to accomplish this is something called the base and bounds approach. From our perspective, where we are the operating system, the hardware is going to expose to us two new registers, a base register and a bounds register. The operating system, we, us, the operating system, we're going to have the ability to put values into these registers when a process gets loaded. And the hardware is going to use these, the values in these registers first, the base as an offset, and it's going to use the bounds as kind of a limit. This is the highest physical address that this process should be able to have access to. The hardware itself then is responsible for actually doing the translations. And I mean, there's a, here's a formula that describes that, but it's pretty straightforward. The physical address in memory is equal to the virtual address in that the process has, plus the base that we have in that register. Let's look at an example instruction and the memory layout from figure 15.2 together to try and see how this base and bounds registers work. So here's figure 15.2 again, and here is that same move L instruction. This is uh, the instruction at address 128. In this setup, the base register, the operating system will have set the base register for this process to be 32 kilobytes. So some, it would be set to 32 kilobytes, and the bounds register here would be set to be 48 kilobytes. So the physical address space for this process is 16 kilobytes, and that corresponds to the, uh, the virtual address space. What would happen is that when this, pro when this process is actually running on the CPU, the program counter might be set to be 128. We're going to load this instruction next. When this fetch actually happens, when the fetch for this instruction happens, the hardware is going to dynamically do this translation. It's gonna take the address 128, which is the next thing to load. It's going to take the base register and it's gonna add those two together. And it's gonna get something at around 32 kilobytes plus 128. That's where it's going to fetch from, from physical memory. When the move L actually is executed, when we're referring to uh, a location in memory to fetch from to get this into a register, we're going to say that EBX is at something like 15 kilobytes in virtual address space. So to fetch EBX, to fetch the value at 15k in virtual address space in physical memory, we'll have to add that base register to it. So we'll say 15k plus 32k and what we'll get is somewhere around 47k. This is the base register and this basically gets us into that user process as physical location in memory. We can make these translations now from the virtual addresses that a process has to the physical addresses that are in memory. This gets us into memory but it doesn't prevent that user process from getting out of its locations in memory, out of its allocated address space in memory. This is where that bounds register comes in. The bounds register here is this, a value that we're going to set that will allow the processor and the hardware to make enforcements about, this is the limit, this is the highest value address that this process can address physically. The part of the CPU that's responsible for doing all this is called the MMU, the Memory Management Unit. So this is physically a piece of the processor that's responsible for using these ad, the, the, the registers, the base and bounds registers, and doing the dynamic translation from virtual addresses that the, that the process sees to the physical addresses that are in physical memory. To get a better idea of how this base and bounds registers work, let's do a couple of translations sort of in the context of figure 15.2.
The difference that we're going to do with figure 15.2 and what we're doing with these example lookups is that the address space for the process is it's going to be drastically reduced down to 4 kilobytes instead of 16 kilobytes. For a process that has an address space of 4 kilobytes, when we look up address 0 and it has a base of 16 kilobytes, so it's in the same kind of location as the process that we were looking at before, the virtual translation here would be 16, the value of base, plus 0, the virtual address. And that gives us 16 kilobytes. To look up the address 1 kilobyte is the same sort of approach. Take the value in base, add to it the value, the virtual address that we're looking up, and we'll get the physical address that we're looking up, so 17 kilobytes here. Looking up virtual address 3000, we add to that 16k and we get the address 19384. When we look up address 4400 now, 4400 is out of bounds of the, of the virtual address space of 4 kilobytes for this process. So what would happen is that the hardware would issue a fault. It would compare the physical address that was calculated to the value of the bounds register that the operating system set up when it put this process onto the processor. And the hardware would then issue a fault and say, no, you, you can't actually access that because it's outside the bounds of the address space that you've been given access to. The base and bounds register themselves now give us this ability to relocate processes in memory with some additional hardware support. Having the registers is not quite enough. There's a little bit more that the hardware needs to do. And figure 15.3 here is going through all of the requirements that the hardware has to provide to us to enable support for this mechanism. So let's take a look at the hardware support, the list of hardware supports that need to be provided to us as an operating system to be able to enable this. The first hardware requirement that we have to have from this goes all the way back to this idea of direct execution. And the first hardware requirement that we have from this is to have a privileged mode. So to have a user mode and then some kind of a kernel or operating system mode that has the ability to access certain instructions, that has the ability to change certain registers that normal user processes shouldn't be able to have access to. For the operating system side, we need to be able to set these base and bounds registers so that the translations can happen on the part of the user process. We also do not want user processes to be able to change those values. We don't want a user process to be able to relocate itself in memory. And we don't want a user process to be able to access the memory of other processes by relocating its base and bounds registers. So the way that we might enable this is to have these base and bounds registers only available to be read and written when, it's, when the processor is in that privileged mode, when we've done that switch to hard, from, when we've had the hardware do that, that mode switch for us. We also need the base and bounds registers themselves, so we, we just have to have these registers for the operating system to be able to put this information into when it does the switches. We need to have some kind of mechanism to do the translations, so the hardware itself needs to provide support to do the translations and referring to these base and bounds registers. I don't really know why we have to have separate privileged instructions. This kind of depends on the, the CPU architecture itself. These might be separate instructions that the operating system is able to execute when it's in privileged mode, or it might be a set of registers that the operating system is able to write to when it's in privileged mode. We also need to have privileged instructions to set up what should happen when a fault happens. This goes, again, all the way back to this idea of direct execution. One of the first things that the operating system does when it's starting up the machine is tell the hardware what code it should call when an interrupt happens. So this was that trap table. When system calls are made, there's this trap table that gets referred to, and this is how the hardware tells the operating system what was being asked to be executed. So we need to be able to expand on this idea and add some additional locations for the operating system to tell the hardware what it should do when an exception happens, when a fault happens, when a process tries to read or write to memory that's outside the bounds of what it was permitted to do. And finally, we need the ability for the hardware to raise exceptions. So we need it to be able to take these instructions and then do something when something bad happens. The approaches that we've seen previously are things like timer interrupts. These are things that just fire as events occasionally in the system. 
In this case, we need the hardware to actually be able to respond to certain kinds of instructions being executed and then inform the operating system that this has happened. From our perspective, from our perspective as an operating system, we basically are going to stop and say, that's what we need from hardware. We're not going to really talk about how hardware implements this stuff because that's outside the scope of this course. But we just need to say that we need these things from hardware in order for us to be able to use this system. The operating system then also needs to change some of the stuff that it's doing to be able to do this stuff. Some of the requirements that an operating system is going to have is memory management. One of the things that, a memory, what that an operating system needs to do here is to allocate memory for new processes in physical memory. We've got these address spaces that a process needs to be able to use. So we need to be able to say as an operating system that this chunk of memory belongs to this user process. When processes then terminate, when they're finished, we need to be able to reclaim that memory and say that it is free for use for some other new process that might start up later. And we need to be able to generally manage this memory using some kind of structure like a free list. As an operating system, we're going to need to be able to change the values of these base and bounds registers. And we're also going to need to be able to maintain the values of these base and bounds registers per process. This is something that we're going to need to do on context switch. So as we're switching between processes, we're going to need to change the value of base and bounds to be the value of base and bounds for the process that's just being put on the processor so that when the hardware does these translations, it has the correct base and the correct bounds for doing the translations. And finally, we have asked the hardware to give us the ability to tell it what code to execute when there is an exception. As an operating system, we actually have to implement that code of what to do when there is an exception. So either terminate a process that is breaking these rules by sending back a signal that says something like segmentation fault, or yeah, that's pretty much it. One kind of interesting thing to note about this is that because the operating system has the ability to set these base and bounds registers per process, it's able to put this in the PCB for the process. It also means that the operating system has the ability to move these user processes around physically in memory at runtime. So, well, well, I guess while the process is not currently running on the CPU, but in between when it's being scheduled and not scheduled. The operating system has the ability to move these user processes around and then just adjust the base and bounds registers before that process gets put back onto the CPU. So let's take a look at figure 15.5. This is a similar diagram to what we saw in the earlier chapters of this book when thinking about limited direct execution. But now we've amended this a little bit to think about what we need to do on top of what we had been doing before for the purpose of virtualizing memory. So at the very beginning, the operating system is responsible for setting up the trap table, initializing the trap table. The hardware then is going to be responsible for keeping track of the addresses and keeping track of the values that the operating system is providing to it here. So that means that, for example, the hardware has to keep track of the addresses that need to be that need to be executed in the operating system when certain system calls are being made. It needs to remember the address of the timer handler that the operating system has. Now, it also needs to do things like remember the address of the illegal memory access handler. So when a user process tries to go outside of the bounds of its address space, what code in the operating system should it call? And likewise, if we have illegal instructions being executed. So, so if, for example, a user process tries to execute something that's not in its level of privilege, what should the operating system do? So what code in the operating system should be called? Once all of that has been set up in hardware, the operating system takes over again, and it's responsible for actually telling the hardware to start the interrupt timer. The hardware then starts the interrupt timer and it fires that every once in a while, periodically. At that point, the operating system takes over again and it does this initializing the process table, so keeping track of the processes that are currently running 
and it initializes this free list. So it's keeping track of the regions of memory that are not currently in use by processes. Let's now take a look at figure 15.6 to get an idea of how this dynamic translation happens once a user process has started running. This again is very similar to some of the diagrams that we already saw for limited direct execution, but now we've added this translation layer into it. So at the very beginning, we're starting process A here. Starting process A means that some other process is called fork and exec, or, or alternatively, this is the first process that the operating system is starting itself. When the operating system starts process A, it's going to make some allocations for the process itself. So in the process table, it's going to create this process control block, and it's going to put this process control block into the process table. The new thing that it does now is it's allocating memory for the process. So we've got this giant chunk of physical memory, and we have these smaller address spaces for a process. The operating system is going to make a reservation and say that this chunk of memory is going to be for this process. And it can keep this information in the process control block. And the way that it does that partly is in the base and bounds registers themselves. So then the operating system is going to set the base and the bounds registers for this process in its process control block. At that point, we're going to do this return from trap. So the hardware had previously trapped a system call, which might have been something like fork or exec, and we're going to return from trap into A. So now we're going back from the operating system side into the user mode side, and we're going to start executing code in process A. So the hardware's responsibility then is to start restoring some of the registers for A. The operating system, remember, is responsible for doing the context switch itself, but the hardware is going to have to have some responsibility for setting up some remaining registers for process A. Then it does the switch to user mode. So when it's in the operating system mode, it's in that privileged uh, operating system mode. So now we're switching back to user mode and then we're jumping to A's initial program counter. So where the program starts executing for process A. At that point, process A starts running and it begins to fetch an instruction. Fetching an instruction now means that we have to do this translation between virtual addresses and physical addresses. So we immediately go back to the hardware side. We're not doing a, a switch here. We're not switching between the operating system and the user process. All we're doing is switching from the code that's being executed in the process to the translation part of what has to happen in hardware. The, uh, the hardware itself then is responsible for translating the virtual address for where this process is first instruction actually is, and then it does the fetch. It fetches from the physical location in memory where, where this virtual address pointed to, and it then executes the instruction back in the process A side. The execute instruction then has to go back to the hardware side and start to ask some questions about what this instruction is actually doing. So if it's an explicit loader store, that means that it's going to refer directly to memory in some way, shape, or form. Then we have to make sure that the address, we have to do the translation and make sure the address is actually legal. So we're going to check to see, does this fit within the address space of this process by referring to the bounds register? And provided that it is a valid address, we're going to do the translation itself, and then we're going to actually do the load store on the hardware side. Then we'll switch back to process A and process A will just continue to run. So lots of stuff like this is going to keep happening. Fetch instruction, do the translation for the instruction, execute the instruction, decide what kind of instruction it is, and then do more processing. We're going to keep doing this for a while and then eventually this timer interrupt is going to fire. And at that point, we're going to actually do the switch into to kernel mode and then jump to the handler for the operating system. So this is doing the mode switch and then switching into the operating system side. The operating system now is going to decide which process should run, and the decision that it makes is to stop A and to start process B. We call the switch routine, so this is the context switch actually happening here. And we're going to save the registers for A into the process control block for process A. So this is that two proc struct A, including the base and the bounds registers now. Once we've finished saving those registers, then we're going to restore the registers for process B. We're going to take the process control block that we have in memory for that process, and we're going to put those onto the CPU itself. 
and then we're going to return from trap. When we switch from the operating system to the hardware side here, we're going to start restoring the registers. So restoring the remaining registers for B, so like the process counter, we're going to switch to user mode and we're going to jump to the, the, the address at the program counter. Process B starts to load and we have this thing execute bad load. So here we're trying to say that uh, process B is trying to load something from memory that's outside of the bounds of its address. So at that point, we switch to the hardware mode and the load is out of bounds. So we tried to fetch something from memory at an address that's not within the bounds of this process. So at that point, we switch to kernel mode. Previously, we just switched right back into the user mode because the, the load was a, for a valid address within the address space of that process. But this time, we're switching directly into the operating system mode and we're jumping to that trap handler. The operating system then has to handle the trap and it makes the decision to kill process B. So process B tried to access something outside of its bounds, outside of its address space, so the process gets killed. And then the operating system, because this process has terminated, has to go through this process of cleaning up after that process is finished. So it has to deallocate the memory for, for process B. That means that it has to mark it as not being used anymore and it has to free the entry for B in the process table. Okay, so this is pretty cool. We can now have multiple processes running on our system and the processes don't have to care about where they're physically located in memory. Every process just makes this assumption that it starts at address zero. And processes don't have to worry about other processes interfering with their memory. They also don't have to worry about accidentally interfering with another process's memory. We're also able to do this pretty quickly now. We've, we've waved our magic hardware wand at this problem, and we've said, hey, the hardware is responsible for doing these translations, so it's going to be quick. We've said that the hardware is responsible for doing these translations, so it's going to be safe. We've got this extra intermediary that's responsible for checking on our behalf whether or not address lookups are valid or not. Base and bounds itself is a specific kind of virtualization technique. It does solve the problems that we wanted to solve. It's fast, it's transparent, and it is safe, but it has problems in and of itself. One of the problems that we have with base and bounds is that we allocate the entire address space for a process. Allocating the entire address space for a process can be pretty wasteful. Let's look again one more time at figure 15.2 here. In figure 15.2, this middle chunk of this process is marked as allocated but not used. That allocated but not used region is, is bigger than the allocated but used region. This allocated but not used chunk of memory is wasted. Other processes could have used that memory and we could have fit more processes into memory than the three we currently could fit into this with 16 kilobyte address spaces. That this has been allocated but not used is this problem of internal fragmentation. This chunk of memory within a process within an allocation has not been used for anything where it could have been used for something otherwise. The next set of topics that we're going to look at are going to try to solve this problem. And it's going to generalize on this idea of base and bounds. It's going to generalize on this idea of base and bounds by trying to have multiple different sets of base and bounds registers for a single user process. And it's going to try to take advantage of this idea of knowing about things like the code section and the heap section and the stack section. These are explicitly going to be referred to as segments. And I'll give you a little preview here. We're going to finally figure out what the hell segmentation fault means. And then we're going to quickly find out that it's not actually true anymore and it's just a historical artifact. So that's it for our initial look at virtualizing memory with the base, this idea of base and bounds registers. Thanks for listening and I'll, I'll see you soon.